So without further ado, let us start and uh, let's see Peter and Barbara. Hi everyone and thanks for tuning in. This is a talk by two people, Petra and Barbara. I'm a linguist and Barbara is a developmental psychologist. We are both at the Baby Lab, which is run by the Cognitive Science Department of Central European University. Today we want to tell you about a field of experimental psychology called infant cognition, with a focus on what questions it tries to answer and what methods it uses to answer them. Research on infant cognition has a unique ways of problem solving because we work with unique people, human babies. Uh, today we will give you examples of how we solve problems and some applications of our insights. To narrow it down a bit, we will talk about a specific thing, which is still very large in itself, which is how infants learn language during the first year of life. Uh, in the first part, I will talk about a handful of temple studies that have been replicated and expanded on a million times to show how we find out about new things in this line of business. In the second part, Barbara will uh, show you a specific study uh, from our research lab that will demonstrate what data we generate and how we use it to draw inferences. She will also mention a few applications. So let's begin with the big picture. I'm going to talk about typical development and spoken language, and these are important restrictions. Signed languages are fully fledged languages on their own right, and are fascinating sources of insight on how humans learn to think and learn to communicate. I just don't know enough about them to cover them here properly. But I think it's also very interesting to talk about spoken language and one-year-old babies, or even younger babies, for two reasons. First, as anyone who knows uh, speech-to-text systems or works on speech-to-text systems will probably agree speech is really hard to crack, full of finicky, unsupervised learning problems. To begin with, you have to recognize speech as a communicative act, in contrast to music or the rustling of leaves. Then you have to pick up on the fact that there are recurring sound segments in the audio signal, then you have to recognize that these segments form words. The words form sentences, this all means something. All the while, every person talking to you will sound slightly different uh, or very different, and they can even talk to you in different languages. And babies seem like unassuming candidates for learning all that. This is because language production lags language perception in development, so babies do start babbling, typically very early on, but the first recognizable words only show up around the age of one. And children only really build up a sizable enough vocabulary to carry a conversation around the age of three. And this is precisely what makes infant minds so fascinating, because they are extremely efficient learning machines that can pick up on all the stuff I talked about. Speech versus noise, recurring sounds, recurring words, different speakers and all that. Meaning that babies have everything under their belt by the age of one to get really good at their native language in a couple of years. Learning language is one of those things that young human minds are very good at, better than any existing algorithm. So, how can we tell that, though? This is the gist of infant research. Finding out how the human mind develops and learns by getting responses from an organism with a narrow behavioural repertoire, a human baby. Early work on infant cognition focused on getting a behavioural response to stimuli. This has been quickly expanded using neuroimaging methods, methods that track neurophysical correlates of brain activity. So how can we tell whether a newborn can recognize her native language? Many of our behavioral methods center on the concept of habituation. Habituation comes originally from neurobiology. In experimental psychology and learning theory, it generally means that if something keeps happening, you stop paying attention to it. What's far more interesting here is this habituation. This is where something changes and you pay attention again because new things are interesting. And I'm saying pay attention and interesting, but these are very low level processes that are present in very simple organisms. And here's the twist. You can only dishabituate to a change, you can only start paying attention to the thing that's suddenly more interesting if you can tell on some level that change has happened. To give you an example that's not very sophisticated, I can get used to seeing a red light and then I can react to it turning green only if I can tell red from green. And if I can't, I will not react to this change. Going back to babies, in a 1988 study, Jacques Mailer and his colleagues played French and Russian language recordings to four day old French babies. Uh, Mailer and colleagues wanted to know if babies can tell the difference between the two, French and Russian. Uh, they used the suckling paradigm to find out. 
They gave each baby a pacifier and connected the pacifier to a polygraph that measured the speed with which the baby was suckling on the pacifier. A baby will suckle on the pacifier faster when something interesting is happening. Their attention will gradually wane over time and the suckling will become slower. If a noticeable change happens, suckling becomes faster again. And this is what happened in the Mailer study. Based on the suckling response, French babies found French more interesting than Russian. When the tape was changed from Russian to French, babies noticed that too, but they didn't react to French changing into Russian. So Miller and colleagues argued that this showed an extremely early preference for one's native language. The suckling paradigm was used very successfully to show that very young infants make a difference between language and music, different languages, and even different sounds within the same language. In a similar suckling study by Imus at Brown University in the 70s, infants responded to the sound da changing to ga. Imus completed the experiment with 48 babies in two groups, but needed to record it with 115 to get that number. And I want to actually quote his breakdown of the dropouts, because it's very characteristic of infant research. Falling asleep, 33%. Crying, 25%. Initial failure to suck on the nipple, 20%. Ceasing to suck during the course of the experiment, 7%. And a group of factors consisting of failure to show satiation, an extremely erratic pattern of sucking, equipment failure, and experimenter error, 15%. Later work gradually moved away from the suckling paradigm. Janet F. Worker and her colleagues at the University of British Columbia did amazing work in the 80s, sort of combining language and sound, showing that very young babies notice all sorts of sound differences, including ones that don't exist in their native language. As they get older, though, they actually lose this ability. Worker studies typically used the head turn paradigm. So how do we use that to find out if a baby knows the sound repertoire of her native language? There's a loudspeaker in a room slightly to the baby's side, playing a synthesized recording. And when a change happens in the recording, a shiny toy lights up for a moment next to the loudspeaker. If you're the baby, you want to use the change as your cue to look at the shiny toy, because shiny toys are great. But if you can't hear the change, you can't anticipate anything, so you won't turn your head. Simple? Not really, because you might turn your head anyway, or not pay attention, and we can't tell how much you notice the change, and so on. For example, Jenny Safran, Richard Eslin, and Alyssa Newport's 96 study on word discrimination used a variation on the head turn paradigm, which basically measured how long the infants looked at the loudspeaker after the change. This is how they showed that infants can learn simple statistical regularities in the transitional probabilities of sound in a sequence, and then use these to pick up on where word boundaries are in the otherwise unsegmented audio stream. And this is classic stuff, it's been pretty well known in machine learning and varied upon and honed in ever since. Looking time studies are used to this day to test whether infants find something unusual or unexpected. But the current state of the art in behavioural research is a more sensitive method, eye tracking. Basically, eye tracking tells you where someone is looking on a screen. All the eye trackers were pretty sensitive and you practically had to bolt the participant's head to the table to make sure that the eye tracker could keep following where they were looking, which is not really an option with babies who do however they please. Modern eye trackers use calibrated reference points to valiantly keep track of an infant's gaze as they gleefully move around in their mum's lap watching the screen. Eye tracking opens up possibilities, for example, in studying word meaning, and Barbara will talk more about this in a second. So by now you've got in the mood of behavioral research, you think of a contrast like language and music, or this language and that language, or this and that sound, and then you try to see if babies respond to it at a certain age. Then you move on to the next contrast, and so on. It's like debugging the brain one line at a time. And you find out how things sort of build on each other. Very young babies are sensitive to language. We all sort with some general tools to process it, and as we get older, we pick up on the details of what the sounds are, what the words are, and finally what it all means. The concurrent alternative to behavioural research is neuroimaging, where you track correlates of brain activity. You can measure the electric activity of neurons, blood flow in the brain, blood oxygen levels in the brain, and so on. 
The spatial and temporal accuracy of these methods can vary. Some of them can find small changes in brain activity but not locate them very well in time and space. Others only pick up big changes but they are very good at pinpointing where they are. Uh, modern neuroimaging methods are not invasive. For example, a baby will have to wear a smart little cap usually and unless they hate that, they won't really experience any discomfort at all. Neuroimaging is not a magic bullet. It tells us what areas of the brain take part in certain processes, but we also need to understand what these areas do and how they work together. Still, neuroimaging has brought remarkable advances in understanding how baby brains work. To give you one tiny, simple example, uh, we know the adult brain has a massive functional asymmetry. The major brain networks responsible for the production and processing of speech are in the left-hand side of the brain. So when does this specialization come about? Are we born with it? To put it very simply, a behavioral study can tell you that a baby is responding to their native language differently than to music or a single tone, but it won't tell you whether the brain areas responsible for this are the same ones as an adult. Dean Lambert and colleagues in a 2013 study found that uh, two three-month-old babies show activation in the same areas of the brain as adults when listening to speech. Uh, and this study used functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, but the brain's early specialization for speech has been demonstrated using other methods as well, like EEG or near-infrared spectroscopy. And this converging evidence shows that this adult-like asymmetry comes very early in development. In what follows, let's try to have a look at whether babies understand anything from what we tell them and what we suggest typically do to figure this out. Myself, I study how babies learn to communicate and in particular how they come to discover the meanings of the first words. So I would like to take you a little bit behind the scenes of my experimental methods and different results in the domain of word learning. So one way to get a sense of whether babies understand words and what kind of words they understand is to have a look at their brain and in particular at what their brain is doing when we label different objects for them. For example, I might point to the screen and say, there is a duck. If you understand the word duck, your brain will prepare to see a duck as the screen goes down. However, it might happen that I will say there is a duck but in fact, a different object will show up as the screen goes down. What will happen then? Your brain will react to this situation in a special way that we can capture in EEG recordings as an index of semantic violation. That is, of a situation when the words and their meanings are somewhat off. When you look at the graphs that I'm showing you, the blue lines indicate uh, situations when the objects were labeled correctly, while the red lines indicate situations where the objects were called with wrong names. In the upper row, you can see the reaction of adult brains, and in the lower row, you can see that the very same neurosignatures, so basically the uh, red lines drifting away from the blue lines, is evident already in nine-month-old babies who see simple objects being mislabeled for them. But what to do when we don't have expensive neuroimaging equipment at hand? Fortunately, there are other ways, some as simple as just basically following baby's looking behavior in response to speech. The logic here is fairly simple, and I'm going to illustrate it straight away with an example of an infant task from our lab. Hi baby, look! Where is the teddy? Teddy! Teddy! Upon watching this short animation, you probably moved your eyes to the teddy bear and stayed there for a short while. Such a response would show me that you have an idea what the word teddy means and what kinds of objects in the world it picks out. If, instead of asking you about a teddy, I asked you, for example, where is the moxie? Your guess should be more random because the word moxie does not exist in English and you would have no way to interpret what I want from you. This very logic provides a pretty simple but powerful tool to investigate word knowledge and can be used in very young babies. What I have just shown you was a trial from an infant task. Let me now bring your attention to the structure of our trial 
and explain how we analyze it. So first, we briefly show two objects in silence to get a sense where babies attend to before either of the objects is labeled. This period is called baseline. Then we provide the labeling phrase, we ask about one of these objects, and finally, as soon as this labeling phrase ends, we start monitoring whether the presence of the word influenced how the babies are exploring the scene with their eyes. This period of the, of the trial is called test. How will we analyze our results? Well, one way to do that is to define so-called areas of interest, one around each object, and check how many gaze points will register in each of these areas of interest. Then, we can, for instance, calculate a proportion of looking to the named object, here Teddy, by taking the amount of looks to the Teddy and dividing it by the total of looks to the Teddy and to the other distractor object. To check whether looking to the Teddy change in response to a word, we will calculate this proportion of looking to the named object both for the baseline period and the test period, and we will subtract the baseline proportion from the test proportion. If the result of this subtraction is positive, this would mean that the baby increased her looking to the named object at test. If this result is negative, it would mean that she decreased the looking to the subject at test relative to the baseline. And if the value is around zero, that would mean that basically there was not much change between both of these test phases. What you see here are some sample results from a single participant from our recent study. This particular baby had four trials with two, with two different familiar words, car and cup, and you can see that on three out, out of these four trials, she increased her looking to the named object at test relative to the neutral speechless baseline period. When running a study, we would collect this kind of data sets from more children, typically between 20 to 30. Sometimes, we would compare children of different ages, like in this example, where age ranges from 12 to 20 months. This would allow us to see how word recognition improves around and after the first birthday. These kinds of results that you see here provide evidence that before infants and toddlers start to speak, they have a small receptive vocabulary, or in other words, they understand a number of common words. One interesting question that comes up in view of these results is how babies do that. How do they decipher the meanings of the, their first words? You must note that this is absolutely not a trivial task. Most of the words in our languages, and even very simple concrete words such as table or dog or car or house, have no direct links with the objects they stand for. Linguistic symbols are in an arbitrary relationship to the concepts they denote. Therefore, we cannot guess this relationship a priori, we have to learn it. Babies have to figure it out. And how do they go about it? Well, we know that they are pretty good statistical learners, and we know that they put the statistical learning mechanism to use at this task as well. So, for example, when they, they notice that certain uh, word forms tend to co-occur with certain kinds of objects. So, for example, the word cat would come up more often in the presence of an actual cat around than when there is no cat around. And babies will pick up on this regularity and then they will somehow associate the word cat with the concept, uh, concept of cat. This can happen basically by just by 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 listening to this to the speech and by observing what kind of things are around you. But this is not the only way how the word meaning can be approached. Another way would be to actually pay attention to what people who talk to you do. So we know that language never falls from the sky. It comes from other people who communicate to us. And these people perform a whole lot of extra linguistic actions. So they would gesture like I do a lot. They would look at things they talk about, they would point to things as well. So uh, they would provide the one 
who, who is who is listening to them, who pays attention to what they say with lots of pragmatic cues to what they mean, to what the words they use mean. Do babies use these kinds of pragmatic cues to meanings and, and to, to meaning and reference? We tried to figure this out in a recent study. We showed 12-month-old babies two novel objects, and then some of babies saw pointing when one of these objects was labeled, while other babies would saw grasping. These two nonverbal actions are fairly similar, but only one of them, namely pointing, is clearly communicative. We point when we communicate with others, but not in many other situations. Grasping, on the other hand, can take place a lot and for a number of instrumental or selfish reasons that have nothing to do with communication. For example, you will grasp your cup of you will grasp your cup of coffee whenever you want to have a sip of coffee. You will grasp your phone because you want to ch check what's the weather forecast for tomorrow, etc., etc. Nothing to do with communicating with others. Now, guess which babies learn the new words? Those who saw pointing, those who saw grasping, all of them. Well, only those babies who saw pointing realized that the words that co-occur with pointing are actually relevant for what's going on and mapped these words onto the objects that were pointed at. We believe this means that babies interpret what's going on when they hear people talking and take subtle differences between actions they see to make guesses about what the accompanying speech means. We promised that we would talk a little bit about some applications of developmental science. It seems like a great idea, I think, that the findings uh, about learning, about uh, language, about memory, and this, all, all sorts of other phenomena that are being established by developmental science community could be somehow used in education, or more specifically in, in early education. Unfortunately, and quite surprisingly actually as well, there hasn't been much, much cross-talk between the, these two disciplines uh, so far, but it has started to change in the, in the recent years. Another uh, field uh, where this basic research in developmental science uh, is, uh, can, be, can be potentially applied is um, atypical development. I showed you before how we can draw some interesting conclusions about young minds and mechanisms of language learning from relatively simple eye-tracking data, but there is much more to these data. Each visit to an area of interest, or an AOI, might be composed of different-looking behaviours. For example, there can be more or less saccades, or eye movements, or the fixations falling within an AOI, that is periods of time when the eye is stationary on different parts of the target, can have different duration. Extracting fixations from the infant eye tracking data is a little bit of a challenge because the data is more noisy than the adult data, but it is possible. And I mention it here because it provides us a way to develop tools that can uncover early signs of autism. For example, researchers have shown that when you leave infants explore spontaneously images, the fixations made by typically developing infants will be longer than spontaneous fixations made by infants whom later on are diagnosed with autism. This logic of comparing the behavior of typically developing infants and kids with the behavior of infants who later develop signs of autism can be applied not only to fixation durations but also to other phenomena and can help us identify very early behavioral markers of developmental disorders and eventually make possible an earlier diagnosis. I hope we could convince you that some exciting language learning is going on very early on in development and also that we could give you some insight into how it is studied. Thank you very much for listening and we are really looking forward to your questions. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, pretty interesting uh, presentation. I can say that I can definitely relate to having a 14 month old at home, which I hope you won't hear, but there is a chance. So um, we'll wait a few minutes so Barbara and Peter can uh, join. In the meantime, if you have uh, any questions, then please drop in the, uh, the chat. And uh, we will go to the questions in a minute.
So Barbara arrived. We wait a, a little bit for Peter. But in the meantime, I do have a question actually. And uh, so I will take a precedence and ask it. So um, usually, um, usually every every research topic has some main challenges. Like we heard that, for instance, data collecting in healthcare is problematic because there are certain data that you would like to have, but it's not ethical to actually collect that kind of data. Like we cannot withhold treatment from patients. What would you say that in your research area, what are the main challenges or like what are the things that kind of causes you the biggest problems and things like that? Yeah, so let me take that and let's see whether Peter can, can add something. So the, definitely the biggest challenge is basically, so we are working with a very special population. And so the, uh, the biggest challenge is how to maximize the number of data collected for participants, right? Because if you have a baby, the baby is happy to do one thing for just about this much time, which is 10 to 15 minutes. And this is how much time you have to collect your data. So you have to really struggle and be ingenuous to get as much data as possible. Um, in that very short time, I think that's the uh, that's the if we talk about experimental research, of course. Yes, uh, Peter, <laughs> what would you say about the main challenge? Yes, it's definitely this. Um, you know, uh, a sociologist might think about things like representative samples and cross-cultural diversity. We are just happy to have enough. Uh, participants in our studies to get some signal from the noise, really. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, as a follow-up question, uh, what would be what would you say that the you would be very happy to get to answer questions? So what are the questions that you'd be very happy if, like, say, in five years' time, you could answer? Because mo not maybe sometimes it's not a single question, but many research areas has like this kind of. Um, almost like light people go towards and like they try to solve what in your case what would be the the question that uh, you would you would try to answer in the next five years maybe it's a long time range but let's go with that it's a tough question it's a tough question. There are many questions like that. So uh, there's some very interesting theoretical questions so basically um, uh, let one thing that so basically lots of this research is about group level tendencies that babies at this age tend to do this or that. Something that I'm really really cur would love to do is to look more at the individual variation and all that because we have relatively little idea, right? We say okay, at uh, at 20 years of age, babies do this. At two years of age, they tend to do that. But it would be so it would be fantastic to basically, with respect to all the different questions that we are studying, to basically be able to develop computational and statistical tools to be able to say something about individuals and how how, how that works. I think that's a, so it's a, yeah, a great methodological challenge that I would like to see us as a, a, a finding answers over the next five years. Yeah. And Peter, do you have exam or something that you would go towards? I be, be, it's, it's something that's happening already, but we'd love it to see more consistent model testing with these types of data. So the recent years, uh, Bayesian learning models have come, kind of come of age uh, in infant research and in, in psychology. So now you have more consistent kind of modeling assumptions and model testing going on, but there's definitely a way to go. So I would be very interested to see that um, be more robust and have kind of a, a, a stronger conversation going on between psychologists who know a lot about how a baby works and uh, modeling people who know a lot about statistics, kind of finding each other. And that's happening at our department to some extent, so it's lovely to see. That's interesting. And uh, how do you select the words? So there was um, there's a question that how do you select the words that uh, you test for, like uh, a common list or, uh, or so how, how do you handle it? Obviously there's a language you know aspect of it, like you probably have a different set of uh, words in the UK and in Hungary and, and things like that. 
Actually, not really. So, um, but it's 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 a good question. So, quite interestingly, it seems like the the um, at least in you know in the European languages that have some sort of common grammatical uh, uh, gr like gr grammatical ancestors to them, the this the same kind of words seem to emerge pretty much at the same age. Um, and uh, how do we select them? Is that uh, there? So for years now. So what what I've shown you is relatively like relatively new thing to test basically knowledge of babies. Ask the babies themselves. Themselves. But for years, people have been asking parents to fill in questionnaires <laughs> and to ask, oh, does your, this, these are 300 words, pick the ones that you think your baby understands. And there is actually large data sets on that. Um, and so as a first approximation, we tend to go and to see basically what parents think kids understand. And so we pick candidates from that, and uh, and from across many languages, you can uh, you can check that, and um, uh, and then other, otherwise, basically, you can um, uh, you can use your 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 psychological knowledge and what what kind of concepts do you think babies have and what kind of words they would understand and test for it. Uh, asking the babies because what we tend to see while we running the studies with kids is that the parents dramatically underestimate what babies know. So you basically show them the words uh, that you run in the study and they would say, yeah, no, 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 this definitely not. And then you check uh, the results of the babies and they actually, uh, with their looking, tell you that they know many, many more words than their parents uh, would guess. <laughs> oh yeah, that's something definitely to keep in mind um about what babies can learn from us all right uh thank you very much it was super interesting uh i think for for everyone i know that i learned a lot like probably there's an extra you know having a baby but uh thank you very much that was uh super interesting thank you thanks guys thanks for having us